and welcome, I'm Sonic Guru. Now back at the San Diego Comic Con 25th anniversary party, fun as a mouthful, we were introduced to Project Sonic 2017 will eventually be renamed Sonic Forces, and a lot of hype was built for this long awaited entry, a darker storyline, the reintroduction of classic Sonic, and the eventual reveal of your own custom character that will fight alongside both Sonics. Since its release it has garnered a great amount of praise and backlash from fans and critics alike. So where do I stand on this spectrum? Let's find out. The story starts at the defeat of Sonic at the hands of Infinite and Eggman's army, consisting of Metal Sonic, Chaos, Shadow and Zabok. Six months later, Eggman has conquered most of the known world, except for a ragtag resistance led by Knuckles. Here's where I question the heroism of these so-called heroes. I guess because of Infinite they couldn't actually stop Eggman? But to be struggling this bad means you're pretty much worthless as heroes when Sonic isn't around. It's not until they recruit a new rookie, you, who actually paves the way for success. What follows is a series of missions to take back the world and to stop the new foe Infinite, powered by the Phantom Ruby. You know, that pink gem from Sonic Mania? Yeah, these games are connected! But despite the serious tone set by the world being in peril, Honestly, there's not a lot going on here. Cutscenes occur before and after stages, with character dialogue being inserted on the world map screen following each level. Certain characters from Sonic's past seem to be inserted into the story with no rhyme or reason. Without the online comics to fill in some of the blanks, the average player is left in the dark. While Sonic himself is chirpy as always, the game tries hard to put some weight behind Eggman's actions, for example literally torturing Sonic during a 6 month gap. The writers wanted the player to take this game's story seriously with its high stakes and occasional dark tones, but it comes off as forced and unfocused. At times there are glimpses of potential for world and character development, especially with Infinite and Eggman's army. But no, there isn't. I may be taking shots at the story of Forces, even though I already made a video about it, but I really don't think it's the worst. This is better than Lost World's Peaks and Valleys and Boom Rise of the Lyric's bland, uninteresting adventure. There is an actual goal for the heroes, the levels are designed around the story rather than the other way around, and even though your avatar doesn't talk, you are actually involved. More so than classic Sonic, who's only there to remind you of Sonic Generations and Mania. You know what, I'm going to take another shot here and say that Infinite is a shit villain. Aside from a couple of scenes which shows him as a serious threat to Sonic, the Resistance and consequently the world, he gets his ass kicked by Sonic after he comes back from being in prison, and then again by your own character. He is meant to be the greatest threat that Sonic has ever faced. Are you serious? The gameplay of Sonic Forces is split between three gameplay types. Technically four, which is a combination of the other two. Sonic, Classic Sonic, and the Avatar. Let me start off with the worst of these. Classic Sonic. Now despite Sonic Generations being released six years ago, Sonic Team don't appear to have learned from its mistakes or taken advantage of what worked especially from the overwhelming success of the fan game turned official nostalgia fueled Sonic Mania. Classic Sonic is shit to play as in Forces and plays exactly like Sonic 4 Episode 1. Now even though I defend Sonic 4, which got better in Episode 2, Generation still came out after Episode 1. He is extremely heavy while jumping, making precise platforming unnecessarily frustrating. Classic Sonic also suffers from acceleration problems. He inexplicably loses momentum at a rapid rate, slowing down too quickly after hitting a speed booster. And when running downhill and up a ramp, forget it, he loses all momentum as he fails to launch skywards. In order to get any sort of sense of speed, you need to spin dash. Bottom line, Classic Sonic is a wasted disappointment, especially after Sonic Mania's spectacular display of tight controls and fluid design. Modern Sonic, or just Sonic as the game likes to display, plays somewhat like the previous Boost games. In fact, it's more akin to Sonic Colors than Unleashed on Generations with the return of the Double Jump. Like Colors, the 3D sections are mostly for spectacle with displays of great speed when boosting, and the 2D sections having most of the platforming. Aside from the side scroll platforming, it seems the game wants as little input as possible when being Sonic. For example, even though this part looks epic and has hundreds of things happening at the same time, all I'm doing is holding down the boost button. Need I mention no drifting either? Yeah, tight corners and muscle memory be damned, just hold the button and boost away. Speaking of little to no input, in several instances, control is taken away for set pieces such as great views of the landscapes or a giant snake. Control is handed back in the form of quick time events. It's not the first time Sonic Team has added QTEs in Sonic games, 
but these are more slowed and quick, giving you ample time to press them once the rings touch, like Elite Beat Agents. This hands-off approach is unnecessary compared to the more split-second response of its predecessors, and feels like the overall boost gameplay has evolved in recent years. The end result is still satisfying, with robot parts flying in a vast draw to the levels being shown. The newest addition to Sonic Forces is the Avatar, your custom hero. The game plays like a combination of both modern and classic Sonic minus the boosting and spin dashing, but comes with the Wisp Bomb, a hyper go on powered flamethrower, and a grappling hook which serves as a makeshift homing attack. Such an avatar is the only character who can use the Wisp powers, which include Red Burst, Ivory Lightning, and Green Hover to name a few. But it entirely depends on what Wisp Bomb you have, as there are seven varieties to choose from. But like modern Sonic, some parts feel automated with the grappling hook, such as rounding corners or grappling to new areas. Not to mention various set pieces to showcase how badass your avatar is. While not a bad thing, I'm not actually playing as my character in these moments, I'm watching someone else write my fanfiction. To me though, the avatar is the best part of the game. I've had more fun playing as my own custom hero than with classic or modern Sonic, even though boosting through the air in modern Sonic levels is quite endearing. Luckily in Tag Team Missions, which is technically a fourth gameplay style, you can play as both your avatar and modern Sonic, by utilising the boost, home and attack, grappling hook and whispering at the same time. There is also the double boost, which is used once per tag team mission. But like the modern and avatar levels, it's used as a set piece. You don't have any control of it when it happens, I can only move left or right during the boost. Plus, even if you don't mash the button to charge it, you can still boost. Kind of defeating the purpose of the button mashing. Finishing stages not only gives you a rank, getting S ranks is slightly more challenging than Sonic Generations, but also experience points to level up your avatar in the form of bronze, silver and gold medals that cap at level 30. This doesn't mean you get the usual RPG upgrades, but new Wisp Bombs with various buffs such as shields and faster wire attacks. Overall, the gameplay of Forces is mostly good, with the classic stages being spread out throughout the course of the game, so the frustratingly capped speed doesn't ruin your experience with the rest of the game. Seriously though, I can't express how much I hate Classic Sonic in this game, which is a shame because Mania was so good. The design of Sonic Forces is pretty straightforward. There was a total of 30 stages including boss fights scattered across the world. A world that does not share the same geography as Sonic Unleashed, so maybe the multiple worlds plot to Sonic X was actually canon after all. Not to mention Green Hill is now a continent, even though it was already established to be a small part of South Island in the first game. At least West Side Island still exists, only now to be completely taken over by Eggman in order to expand his chemical plant into a space station. It makes sense, he did take over the world after all. The levels themselves are simple. I mean, really simple. It's just a straightforward dash to the end goal. Both Modern Sonic and Avatar shared various segments of certain stages as well as a shift between 2D and 3D. They both play differently, one boost and the other has an alien powered gun, but aside from a straight path to a red ring or a shortcut to the finish, nothing about these levels are inherently challenging. Besides a few notable moments, even the tag team stages suffer from the same simple forward motion of each of their respective levels. And like I said when discussing the gameplay of these characters, both the level design and the gameplay turn into a QTE movie set piece. Visually stunning but not engaging. Did I also mention how short the levels are? Because they are. As soon as you get into the flow, the level ends. Makes me wonder why they got rid of the live system of the stages with this easy. Classic Sonic on the other hand is more or less what you expect, but with the gameplay I mentioned before, the challenge comes from not falling into death pits than the level itself. Which is a shame, because the classic stages are actually better designed than the modern avatar stages, with multiple paths and various hazards to avoid. Speaking of level hazards, the Bad and Forces are some of the worst I've seen. Aside from the Motorbug and Buzz Bomber who attack on sight, the Egg Ponds that stand there are waiting to be smashed. In previous games, especially Heroes in 06, they were reactionary and prone to attack when in close proximity. In forces, yet like NPCs or background extras who forgot their stage directions beyond I see Hedgehog and Hedgehog destroys me. That and the designs look like crap. One of the more important aspects of the design of forces is the avatar creation system, which not only allows you to choose your gender, but also from seven different animals. Hedgehog, bird, dog, bear, wolf, cat, and rabbit, each with their own special ability. Unfortunately, there are limited options on how you want your character to look, with only 8 eye shapes and 3 different heads for each character. That means there are a limited number of individually blank characters to be made in this game. Good thing there are various colours and assortment of accessories to choose from in order to make your character stand out, otherwise this would have been a bad implementation of a character creator. But that doesn't mean it's perfect. There are missing features here that would have made this character creation much better if they took a look at other games with custom characters. For starters, not letting me choose the colour of the unlockable hair pieces. 
We allow us to choose the colour of our own body, but not the hair. What if a fan wanted to make Amy's twin sister? Second, having belts, necklaces and backpacks being on a body when they're clearly accessories. And finally, not allowing your avatar to wear two clothing pieces on the body, so female characters can't wear a t-shirt and a skirt. You can make three segments for the head alone, but you can't separate upper and lower body clothes. Overall, I don't hate the customization. There's plenty to choose from to make your character stand out and show up in the game's cutscenes wearing said outfit. It's just that the customization is limited of what it can be. So no lemurs, no bats, not even echidnas, which makes sense to be perfectly honest. Just add more head and eye types, as well as letting me choose the colour of my damn hair. Holy Chaos and Goddess Decal, where do I start? Thanks to the Hedgehog Engine 2, Sonic and his friends never look better with real-time lighting and shadows. Though we see familiar areas such as Green Hill, Chemical Planet and the Death Egg, they've never looked this good. The bold colours and vast vistas make speeding through these zones a treat to the eyes. You don't have to look any further than the Egg Gate stage to see the scale of what this game can achieve. I've said the same thing about Sonic Unleashed, and looking back, also Sonic Lost World to a certain degree, Sega really could just make a whole movie with a graphics engine alone. The downside is that the textures are well... bland. It's not a good sign when Generations and especially Unleashed had better overall aesthetics, but it's clear they took the style of Lost World and left it at that, cubed leaf trees and all. Again, it's not saying it's a bad looking game, no, it's gorgeous. Just look at Metropolis and its sheer white display of futuristic cleanliness, or the contrasting styles of the Casino Forest. But it's clearly obvious that this game could have looked a lot better if they didn't hold back with a simplistic style. Then is the case with the cutscenes. Again, the graphics engine makes them a treat to watch, but the animation is so stiff at times. I hate to say it, but Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric had much better animation, with the boom cast having clear facial expressions and body language. Forces looked like it was made by a first year student using Source Filmmaker or Gary's Mod. And both of those can make great animations. The music is good as always, but it took a unique approach to the styles of music for each character. Classic Sonic has the usual chiptune tracks. They're decent, but compared to many years, they're not as memorable. Modern Sonic again has rocking jazz tracks that are well suited for each stage and gets the blood pumping for high speed antics. Finally, the avatar has vocal tracks with techno beats, with the lyrics themselves establishing the resistance and your avatar's situations and goals. Like with recent games, the soundtrack is a melting pot of various styles and genres such as orchestral, rock, jazz, techno, and even rap, but none of the tracks feel out of place. Well, with the exception of Infinite's theme. If you didn't tell me it was a Sonic theme song, I would have sworn it was produced by Linkin Park. After finishing the game, you get an opportunity to make more avatars, which is necessary for completing all the missions. These missions vary across all stages, such as performing certain tricks, using specific wispins, beating the stage's time trial, and of course, reaching a free gold medal status on each of the seven animals of your avatar. That's a lot of grinding. These missions unlock the various types of gear to dress your avatar with. So if you really want to recreate Buddy, aka Gadget the Wolf from the reveal trailer or Boom Sonic, you better get cracking. Also during the course of the game, you get SOS missions to complete on previously finished stages. Depending on the colour of the SOS signal, you may be required to rescue another avatar, finish a stage as an avatar, or choose to play as an avatar. Aside from the world rankings, this is the game's main online component, which includes the option to rank other people's avatars. As I briefly mentioned before, or you just correctly predicted by playing Colours through Lost World, there are red rings collected each stage, minus the boss stages. Collecting them unlocks extra and secret stages. These are just quick endurance missions based around stage hazards such as fire and vanishing blocks. But if you think that's it, you're sorely mistaken. After collecting all five red rings in the stage, you then have to collect five numbered rings in numerical order, and after you've done that, you then have to collect five silver moon medals in a short amount of time. So, in total, you have to replay these levels at least five times. First, to finish the level. Second, to get an S rank if you didn't get it on the first try. Third, to collect the red rings if you get them all in one go, or collect what's left after the first two tries. Fourth, to collect the five numbered rings if you can find them and not fail. And finally, fifth, to collect the silver moon medals also if you can find them and not fail. Boy, they do give you a lot of replay value. This is not mentioning the free downloadable content that's available. That's right, free. Fuck you, Konami. Aside from the Sega and... <sighs> Sonic gear for your avatar, 
there's also Episode Shadow that is a prequel to the game's events and expounds on the backstory of Infinite. Spoiler, the Jackal is a whining baby. In conclusion, Sonic Forces is a middling game. It's not great, but it's not bad either. All of its downfalls are balanced by its successes. The story is badly written, but the graphics and music are exquisite. The level design is simple to a fault, but the gameplay is fun, though Classic Sonic is the reverse of that. What it boils down to is a mediocre experience that some will enjoy and others will hate. It's certainly not the return of Sonic 06, nor is it Generations Part 2, although it certainly tries to be with a nostalgic pander into its hardcore audience. I won't rate this game, but I still recommend playing it. It's a unique experience to play as your own character, but the pendulum can swing either way with Sonic Forces.